at the Los Alamos Faith and Science Forum, which is a group of scientists, engineers, professionals, and laity helping people to think about science and religion and the harmony and complementarity of these two modes of being and knowing by providing information, education, and a framework for dialogue. The dialogue is the most important part. So as we end up this lecture, for instance, Victoria Earhart has questions that she will um, introduce. And then when we go back out into the lobby, we can sit around those little tables or stand and discuss the questions. They're pretty interesting questions. We can discuss them in here, but that's up to you. Um, and all of us want to delve deeper into the discoveries and mysteries of religion and science and see what we can learn together. Okay, so if anybody has a very interesting topic that they would like the board to consider, uh, please let us know and um, we'll work with you to see what, what that's all about. We love interesting topics. So this is what is going on for the rest of the summer lecture series. They'll all be here in the Sala Event Center. Um, next week, thank you Nels for coming right up. Next week we have Mind Beyond Earth, SETI, UFOs, and the Heavenly Host. Is anybody aware of the current uh, news about uh, UFOs? What do you know? Does anybody know about the whistleblower? No? You know about UFOs? Okay, this is going to be good. Okay. They release a lot of information, but they want a lot of information released. Um, so anyway, it should be a very interesting topic, uh, even though I don't think we're going to be spending that much time on the UFO portion itself. Um, but we'll let Nels cover that next week. But tonight we're going to listen to a talk um, on Islamic bioethics. And this talk is based on a course on Islamic bioethics from Hamad bin Khalifa Medical College in Qatar. <coughs> the talk will cover a discussion on Islamic bioethics with specific reference to how religious authorities and medical authorities in the Middle East Islamic world construct policies regarding the beginning of human life, a two-stage process, and how to determine the end of human life. Time permitting, and I hope we have the time, we may be discussing the Islamic thinking on euthanasia, assisted re reproductive technologies, and abortion. So this is um, Ms. Victoria in a hat. Thanks for that. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> anyway, uh, let me uh, read to you a little bit about Victoria. She has a wonderful past, but we pulled out just a few things. So Victoria completed her undergraduate studies at St. John's College in Santa Fe, New Mexico, the Great Book School. She began graduate school in Hebrew and Jewish studies at the Hebrew, Hebrew University in Jerusalem before moving to Toronto to continue theological studies at St. Michael's College, University of Toronto. She completed theological studies with a concentration in early Christian studies at the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. Victoria has taught world religions at a variety of colleges and universities. Her research interests include Syriac Christianity, pre-modern military history, sustainable and environmental issues, and the intersection between science and religion. Let's welcome Miss Victoria Earhart. Thank you. Thanks for showing up. <laughs> Didn't know there was this much competition. Oh right. no. You're on YouTube. Actually, I am. Uh, I wish to accomplish two goals in this presentation in Islamic bioethics. Now you've got four patients, you know. Okay, the guys in the white turbans, those are doctors. All right, I want to provide a bias neutral information about Muslims and Islam to counter. I counteract what I think is the very ignorant and biased information available to us in our media. And I also want to provide a description of a different model for how science and religion can compete, uh, can collaborate with one another rather than compete. 
the need to collaborate in the social management of science and technology grows increasingly urgent with the availability of AI technology, genetic engineering. These are all based on profit motives with very little thought that I can see for the social and ethical consequences. Okay. So this isn't a paper containing new insights into embryogenesis because I'm not the person to do that. Reputable science is clearly <coughs> materially available to everybody who wants to accept it or deny it or ignore it or reinterpret it based on a pre-existing mindset. What I want to focus on in this talk is the relationship of science and religion that respects insights from both fields of study. Okay. So uh, 50 of the... the mic so that we can, have the, we can hear it on the recording when we go back and listen to it again, because this is so rich. <laughs> if I touch this mic, it falls apart, all right? <laughs> all right, here we go. 50 of the world's countries are majority Muslim. And there are more Muslims than Catholics in the world. There are more Christians than Muslims, but there are more Muslims than Catholics. So it makes sense to take a look at how science and religion interact in bioethics from an Islamic perspective. So uh, I would like to begin our examination of modern Islamic bioethics with the briefest of introductions to the religious tradition of Islam. So the foundational figure of Islam is the Prophet Muhammad, and you can see here his face is veiled. Anyone who has been the center of God's undivided attention is transformed. Moses came down from Sinai with rays, okay? and we can thank Michelangelo for the devil's horn. What an idiot. All right? <laughs> but so you never see the face of the Prophet Muhammad. Once he has had his conversations with God, he is a different kind of person. He's a person, but he's a different kind of person, so his face is veiled. All right, so he's the foundational figure in Islam. He was born to the tribe of Quraysh in Mecca, in present-day Saudi Arabia. He was born in 570 of the Common Era into a reasonably prosperous family. He was orphaned at a young age. He was raised by his uncle, who taught him the family business which was the import-export trade, which is why there's a great deal of business and accounting metaphors and stories in the Quran, which I sometimes used when I taught business technology classes. <laughs> but then I also used clips from The Sopranos in my human resource management class because I thought Tony Soprano had unique ways of dealing with HR problems. <laughs> <laughs> Definitively. Now, both Mecca and Medina in Saudi Arabia were important caravan cities on the Silk Road. Okay. So there's some of his dates, but that's the Prophet Muhammad. Here's where we are. Mecca and Medina. Look on the west coast, the Red Sea. Okay. Mecca, the airport is in Jeddah. Medina is a little bit north. Okay. These are important caravan cities on the Silk Road. So Muhammad grew up exposed to a variety of religions represented in Mecca. And he gained a reputation for honesty in his business dealings. He was hired by a wealthy widow, Khadija, to manage her import-export caravans. And they eventually married and had six children. No sons survived into adulthood. This is touchy. Okay. Now this fact will be of pivotal importance in Islamic history, but we know he had at least one daughter who survived into adulthood, Fatima, and she married Ali, with whom she had two sons. So, like Abraham, Muhammad was a thoughtful, pious man. He was drawn towards monotheism while living amidst the sea of very tribally based polytheism. So in 610, when he was 40 years old, he began to experience vivid psychological episodes, uh, revelations. The primary revelation to Muhammad was an insistence on the return to strict ethical monotheism. 
Islam considers the revelations to the Prophet Muhammad to be the same revelation preached by Abraham and by Moses and by Jesus and the biblical prophets. Worship of the one true God. Islam considers the revelations to Moses and Jesus as true and correct, but these are later messed up by their followers. Muhammad and the early followers thought that the Jews and Christians would recognize the truth of this recent, more recent iteration of revelations to Muhammad and that they would adjust their beliefs and behaviors accordingly. And this did not happen. So what did he preach? Well, he preached the, the five pillars of Islam, the profession of faith. There is no God but God, one and one only, okay? We've heard that before. Prayer, generally five times a day. Fasting during the month of Ramadan, which is when the Quran began to be revealed to Prophet Muhammad. Uh, almsgiving or charity, okay, tithing. 2% of your gross income, but I don't do people's taxes, all right? And if possible, at, at least once in a pious Muslim's life to make the pilgrimage to Mecca and Medina. Okay? So th to me, th these seem very similar to um, major components of faith in Christianity and Judaism. Okay? So Muhammad's preaching of strict ethical monotheism was not at all well received in polytheistic Mecca and it interfered with business. So he was forced out of town with his small group of followers and they fled from Mecca to Medina. So they fled north, right, away from the coast, in 622 of the Common Era or the year one Anno Hijra. So the Muslim calendar begins in the year 622 in the Common Era. So always remember to check your Muslim dates to make sure which <coughs> numbering system you're in. So this flight is called the Hijra in Arabic and it serves as the model for the Hajj every year, which I believe is still the world's largest concentration of people every year, over a million people. Okay. All right, and some of those million people are at the Grand Mosque in Mecca with the Kaaba. That, see that black cube in the middle? That was pre-Islamic, and the idols of the tribe were contained in that Kaaba. And when Muhammad returned to Mecca, he did not take any religious vengeance on anyone, but he did clean out the, the idols in the Kaaba. Okay? So that is, in theory, a million people circumambulating that Kaaba in prayer during the Hajj. And Medina was just a little mud hut when Muhammad was there, but that is now the Mosque of the Prophet in Medina, okay? So Muhammad returns to Mecca, institutes uh, ethical monotheism in there. He dies in 632, so he's back in Mecca for 10 years. He dies in 632 and he leaves no son to succeed him as head of the community. Two options. Some thought the community should be led by a male relative closest to Muhammad, and that would be his son-in-law, Ali. Uh, other, others of the community thought that uh, a, a pious man from among the community should be the leader. Now, Ali died in 661, and Islam split into the two branches. The vast majority of Muslims globally belong to the Sunni branch, S-U-N-N-I, the Sunni branch. The followers of Ali form the branch called Shiite Islam, or the Shiites. And today, to this day, the Islamic Middle East continues to suffer this Muslim-Muslim violence that dates back to the 7th century. So we deal with this problem as well. When Muhammad was still alive, people began to write down and collect his preachings. And like Jesus, Muhammad's preaching ministry was exclusively oral. 
His preachings were collected into the Quran, the sacred text of Islam. Right? Holy Quran. Right? Or, if you need it in Spanish, El Quran. Right? <laughs> and there are, well, like, like British and Foreign Bible Society, you need to make this available in the languages, in the vernacular, so that people can read them. I took my first class in Islam after I moved to Jerusalem, and we used this text. It's called the Noble Quran. It's published by Tel Aviv University, which is not a hotbed of Quranic studies by any means, <laughs> as you can imagine. But this is an exquisite book in that the footnotes of the Quran are geared to the Hebrew Bible, the New Testament, and the Talmud, because it is the same material in this. And so somebody has done a moderately acceptable English translation, but the footnotes are gold, okay? And you can still get this on Almighty Amazon if you're interested. There's nothing particularly in, uh, special about this copy of the Quran, except that it's mine. And I bought it, I bought it in Istanbul on the street of the booksellers that had been there since the Ottoman Empire. And you know, I, it's beautiful. But it took over an hour because we had to go to the mosque to get the, the mufti to grant permission for me to buy a copy of the Quran because I'm a non-Muslim and would it be respectful of the Quran to sell this book? So, so it involved a, a long conversation with, with the mufti, in very poor German, to try and figure out you know, was I a godly enough person to sell the book to? So anyway, that's my copy. There is another book, the Hadith. H-A-D-I-T-H, -H, the Hadith. These are sayings of the Prophet Muhammad that didn't make it into the Quran. Okay, so it, it's a chain of transmission. You can't claim, these are going to be important because you can't claim anything as authoritative unless you can tie it to, and the prophet said. So these are so-and-so heard so-and-so who heard it from so-and-so who heard it from so-and-so who heard the prophet say. And then you have a teaching. And this is just one volume. I think there are 174 volumes. I didn't bring them all. So um, the Quran and the Hadith and possibly the medieval life of Muhammad. Those are the three authoritative sources. If you want to quote in order to have the textual basis for an opinion. Okay? Like the letters of St. Paul, the preachings, the Quran is not organized chronologically or by topic, which makes it very difficult to look things up. The 114 surahs or chapters, surah, uh, they're arranged like St. Paul's letters, longest to shortest. I mean, who thought of that? Right? So if you read basically, except for chapter one, which is an opening prayer. So if you read chapter two, Surah two of the Quran, you pretty much covered it, okay? Because it's a huge, long chapter, hundreds of verses. And they get shorter and shorter and shorter. All right, those teachings of Muhammad not included in the Quran or in the Hadith. Now, the Quran is not a medical text, though it does contain bits and pieces of information on medical topics. So during the pre-modern period, Muslims depended on verses from the Quran, and you still see today in, in rural Islamic people wearing rural Islamic um, the countryside, particularly little kids, they're wearing amulets with with verses of the Quran as as protectors. You know, the same way we wear, some people wear jewelry, or some people wear um, other amulets, if you will. Okay, so they were they dependent upon verses from the Quran and uh, whatever texts from the Greco-Roman tradition had been translated into Arabic. So Pliny's natural history, Aristotle, uh, Galen, all of those. Okay. Basically the thinking was 
God is the healer par excellence. God knows who will be healthy. God knows who will suffer disease and illness, and it is better to trust in God than in doctors. How many people still believe that? Okay? Now, Islam did develop medical knowledge that the Crusaders found useful. There's the opening of the Quran. In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate. Okay? Islam did develop medical knowledge that the Crusaders found useful, and it was much advanced from anything that we had in the West. And there are two Hakims, two doctors, again, the white turbans, and there is that poor pharmacist trying to fill their prescriptions for things. Okay? They had a quite developed pharmacology already by the 13th century. All right? So we're going to leave Islam, medieval Islam, behind. I don't think it's an exaggeration to state that modern Islamic bioethics began on the 25th of July in 1978. Does that mean anything to anybody? 25 July 1978, that's the birth of Louise Brown, the world's first in vitro fertilization baby carried to full term and live birth. Okay? And medical professionals all over the world the next day ask, woke up and ask one another, what does this mean? Okay? So, this led to the establishment of bioethics institutes in the Islamic world. The first one was the Islamic Faith Academy. It's in Mecca. It's, you put a bioethics institute in Vatican City, you know what you're going to get. Okay. Um, well, that's who funds it, so that's what you get. All right. So the second one, uh, the International Faith Academy, the, the legal faith, uh, is in Jeddah, which is... Right outside. Okay. okay. All right. Finally, uh, in 1984, we get the Islamic Organization for Medical Sciences in Kuwait. This is a big one. And then, uh, this surprised me, it was this early. In 1967, there was an Islamic Medical Association of North America established. This is for Muslims who live outside the Muslim Middle East. There is now also um, an Islamic Bioethical Institute or Legal Institute of Sharia Institute in the United Kingdom for British Muslims. Okay. There's currently no medical uh, bioethics institute in Iran to represent the Shiite perspective, which, surprisingly to me, differs from the majority Sunnah perspectives on, on some topics. Uh, these first three primary institutes, they hold conferences. Uh, involving both medical professionals and religious scholars. They are in topics in bioethics, science, medicine. Conference participants submit their papers, uh, technical papers are summarized for the religious scholars, and then the people meet and they engage in a process of collective reasoning called ijtihad, interdisciplinary communication toward a common goal, that religious scholars and scientists are co-muftis, or co-authorities. They have to work together, okay? I think this is a process quite distinct from the secular process of medical reasoning in the West, which is why I was interested in taking this Islamic bioethics class that no one at the University of Qatar could understand why I was in the class. People wash ashore in religious studies departments for the strangest of reasons. Okay, we shall see how this process of interpretation of what are called the occasions of revelations to Muhammad, how these uh, teachings in the Quran are incorporated into the resulting fatwas or religious decisions written in response to medical and scientific summaries presented at these conferences and in the process of discussion and debate, argument ensues, okay? So each institute publishes the conference papers and summaries, and the institute in Kuwait publishes the transcripts of the arguments, which, uh, yeah, that's where, when it gets down and dirty, that's what you want to read. Now, the resulting fatwas, okay? 
I don't know, everybody's heard of fatwa because the Ayatollah Khomeini made a fatwa against the author Salman Rushdie. Everybody thinks fatwas are bad things, but it simply means a religious ruling or decision. Okay? It's, it's a formal ruling on an interpretation on a point of Islamic law and by, given by a qualified legal scholar known as a mufti. Now, this I found interesting. They are considered authoritative, but not absolutely binding. There is still room for minority opinions. A requester who finds, and you can request a fatwa. I have this problem, what do I do? It's exactly what the people did with the rabbis in the Talmud. Right? We have this problem, what do we do? Right? So a requester who finds a fatwa unconvincing, unattractive, not what I was shopping around for, is permitted to seek another opinion. Okay, so these are authoritative but not binding. They're majority opinions is what they are, right? Fatwas. Um, so there's still room for minority opinions, and as I said, the Institute of Kuwait not only publishes the arguments, but sometimes they publish the minority opinions as well. So it, it reminds me of uh, U.S. Supreme Court decisions, where you can read the dissenting opinions when they excoriate each other. Um, this process of, of collective reasoning, or ijtihad, it's not confined just to religious scholars. Think how much of our scientific work is now interdisciplinary, right, Mary? Interdisciplinary. You've got to get people from other fields. So it's also the product of collective input and collective reasoning. Fatwas can also be revised when new information and new problems arise. Okay. So they're not static by any means. Ijtihad is a dynamic process. It goes on every couple of years. There's a meeting at one of the, the three <coughs> institutes in either Saudi Arabia or Kuwait about whatever problem has come up. I know in the next year or two there's going to be a conference on artificial intelligence and, and the Quran and, and what do we do with this, right? So beginning in the 1970s when this became a problem, uh, the field of medicine in the Muslim world uh, it gained enormous prestige and it expanded to, to fill additional aspects of daily life. Healthcare decisions became maybe medicalized. And as more young doctors from the Muslim world who had trained in the West returned to their home countries, the medical curriculum became more secular. It also became much more technical became more secular, and it shifted from Arabic into English so that I could take a class at the University of Qatar at Ibn Khalifa, and it was more or less in English. Okay. This presents challenges to Muslim religious authorities who trained in classical Arabic. Advances in the medical sciences from since the 1970s have not been matched by advances in Quranic studies. And this is a problem. But I think I could say the same of the West, that advances in ethics and legal protections have not kept pace with advances in science and technology. So this problem is not unique to the Muslim world. They simply address it differently. Okay. So there are a number of competing models that, that, or models that we could use to balance the competing claims of science and religion. We can just ignore religion entirely. We've done that. We can reinterpret religious data or religious texts. And we frequently do that. How do you apply these, these texts from societies that are much different? Morally speaking, they may not be that much different, but sociologically, psychologically, Speaking, they are much different. How do we still use these texts, right? We must deal with this every day. When you sit down to write your sermon, you go, what does this? <laughs> How am I going to sell this this week? Okay, so reinterpret the scriptures. Um, people can reject what's in front of their face. We do it all the time. 
we can reinterpret the sense data to fit um, a pre-existing mindset. We do that all the time. Or we can also simply just reject the claims of science, which we do all the time too. So those are different models that we can use. None of them are particularly enlightening. In the secular West, I claim that when religious claims conflict with scientific evidence, then the religious claims are rejected. Okay. Islam uses a different model. It, it reinterprets the religious data or the religious texts. Okay, it's axiomatic that the Quran, which is the eternal and final word of God, cannot be wrong. That's axiomatic. God does not lie. We can get it wrong, but God doesn't lie. So in cases in which current science contradicts statements in the Quran, those verses then have to be interpreted metaphorically, allegorically, some other way, analogically, some other way than literally. Okay? But this also can be highly debated among Muslim religious authorities. Muhammad Hali, he was my teacher. <laughs> he was my teacher uh, for the class. Uh, if you want, if you're interested in Islamic bioethics, much of it is not going to be available. Uh, I had problems getting stuff through interlibrary loan through UNM, but uh, this article on Zygon should be reasonably available. He says it is important to note that the Quran and the Hadith, those sayings of Muhammad that are not included in the Quran, that the Quran and the Hadith are considered permanent and valid, whereas scientific and medical information is contingent and subject to change. I think this, in a nutshell, points to the major difference in how science and religion relate to one another in the Muslim world and the secular West. So let's begin with a question of when does human life begin? Start with something simple, right? When does human life begin? The Quran contains a number of verses relevant to the creation of humans in both their physical and <coughs> metaphysical aspects. So, surah means chapter. Surah 22.5. We created you from dust, then we dropped a seed, then we formed a little clot, then a little lump of flesh, and we caused that you will remain in the womb for an appointed time, and afterward we bring you forth as infants, and give you growth, that you will attain your full strength. Okay? So, created you from the dust. Or, I am creating a mortal out of potter's clay of black mud. So when I have made him and have breathed into him my spirit, do ye, he's talking to the angels, do ye angels fall down, prostrating yourselves unto him. Okay, so Surah 22, completely physical. Surah 15 gives us an indication that there is a metaphysical component, an other than physical component to the creation of a human. Okay? Um, I think it's worth noting as an aside that there is extensive argument in both the Muslim and the Jewish texts of angelology where the angels beg God not to create humans because they are nothing but trouble. <laughs> but we're both. We are physical and metaphysical, and the Quran acknowledges that. Okay? So neither the Quran nor the Hadith are, are texts on embryogenesis, nor is the Bible. So from these two texts, Islamic bioethicists have derived uh, a number of positions, a number of fatwas, okay? So when does human life begin? Pick a time, right? Pick a time. So if we have a fatwa, 
that says human life begins at conception, then I can look in the Quran. I have to look someplace to find a theological point on which to hang my fatwa. We alone created humans from a drop of mixed fluids in order to test them so we made them hear and see. Okay, from a drop of fluid. So this is human life or some kind of life begins at conception. In Surah 53, we, life that we might consider human life begins when a fertilized egg implants in the uterine wall. The Lord is vast in forgiveness. He is most knowing. He produced you from the earth. And when you were fetuses in the wombs of your mothers. Okay, so I've got some basis on which to argue that it's not just the fertilized egg, but when it's when the egg implants. But I also have a fatwa that says embryogenesis is an extremely gradual project process. You can't point to now before something after human. Can't point to any one specific line. Here is the beginning of human life. I also have a fatwa that says it begins at 40 days from conception. Okay? Created everything from clay, fashioned them, then had a spirit of his own creation breathed into them again the definition of a person as both physical and metaphysical. And it gave you hearing, sight, and intellect. You know? Physical and metaphysical. We have a fatwa that says when the brain and nervous system show specific markers of development in neurobiology, or when the brain takes its more or less full shape in the 12th week, well, we have 100, a fatwa for the 120 days after fertilization. This is from a hadith. It's not from the Quran. It's from the hadith of Ibn Ma'asud. The creation of one of you is put together in his mother's womb in 40 days. Okay, so that's the first 40. Then he becomes a clot of congealed blood for a similar period. So we're up to 80. And then a little lump for a similar period. 120 days. Okay. My point is every fatwa has to have a religious basis, okay? And these religious bases form public policy in Muslim countries, okay? Islamic theology and bioethics makes a difference between a living entity and a human being. Okay? This is similar to the, the distinction between a human and a, a human and a fetus that's in Exodus. Men are fighting and one of them smacks a woman who's pregnant and there's a miscarriage and yet no harm follows except for the miscarriage, okay? The one who hurt the woman shall be fined according as the woman's husband shall lay upon him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. But there is no fine for the damage to the fetus, because the fetus is not a person. This is the same distinction that Islam makes. Right? All the majority positions in Islamic bioethics argue that insolment is the marker of human life. Prior to insolment, an embryo qualifies as a living entity. It possesses dignity. Okay? Only after insolment does that, is that living entity considered a human being and therefore acquires sanctity. It is a two-stage process. Dignity, sanctity. I think that's a helpful distinction. Okay. I like this. This is a, a 15th century Persian illustration. That is an angel. You can see the angel's blue wings coming out from there. Okay. Again, the hadith in al Bukhari. Then Allah sends an angel who is ordered to write down four things on the soul. He is ordered to write down the person's deeds, his livelihood, his date of death, and whether he will be blessed or wretched. 
and then the soul is breathed into him. Okay? That's the marker of a person. Right. You like the angel? Predestination. Um, Big time. <laughs> Allah knows. There are four things we're never supposed to ask Allah. Will it be a boy or a girl? Will it rain tomorrow? When will I die? What will my life be like? Okay. Don't do it. <laughs> Fatwas regarding neonatal medical situations insist upon this distinction between dignity and sanctity, before and after insolvent. Medical decisions and procedures are formulated with this medical, within this physical and metaphysical framework. Okay? But all participants in this conference on the question of when does human life begin, they all, all the thoughts was recognized that religious scholars who do not take new medical information into consideration are mistaken in their judgments. It is not sufficient to quote earlier fatwas, the need for collective ijihad that remains ongoing. Conference participants recognized, uh, you have the religious authorities themselves, these are the grand muftis. They recognize that religious rulings not based on current medical and scientific evidence by their own admission should and will be disregarded by the general Muslim population. I, I stress this point because both scientific and religious opinion in Islamic bioethics are stated as, uh, as, as provisional. Okay? They allow ongoing room for collect collective ijtihad. And I think this is unlike the entrenched and unhelpful positions of science versus religion in the West. I think both science and religion need to rein in their tendencies towards epistemological arrogance. We would all be better off. Because we have different opinions on, on how to define uh, the beginning of human life, in bioethics, we're going to, we have different fatwas. Uh, each is based on a religious reference, but we're also going to have differences of opinion on abortion, right? Okay, so here's a couple. Do not destroy a life that Allah has declared sacred, except for a just cause. Kill not your children for fear of poverty. It is we, God, who will provide for them and for you. The killing of them is a great sin. Okay? Most fatwas state that only medically necessary abortion is permitted and then only to save the life of the mother. If medically necessary, then abortion must be performed prior to the 120 days. That is prior to insolment when has dignity, but not sanctity. After insolvent, a fetus possesses dignity and sanctity. Right? So there is a slippery slope argument as to exactly when an embryo becomes a human. And religious authorities are in agreement that insolvent, the metaphysical definition, is the defining marker. Science and biomedical information are secondary. I think that is the reverse in the West. A minority fatwa does uh, allow for an abortion if the fetus will be born with serious genetic def defect or health condition, or if carrying the pregnancy to term would impose a very heavy psychological burden on the woman. Exceptions are also made in case if the woman is pregnant in a war zone and lacks access to medical facilities. Sharia law, which is what we're talking about. Basically, we would, might call it family law. It's, it's not about inheritance and property. And that it's, it's about family law. Sharia law allows for kind of facts on the ground exceptions in specific cases where a majority fatwa would impose an undue burden on either the woman or the married couple. 
fatwas are not zero tolerance, zero discretion decisions. We don't hear too much about that in the West. Okay. Now, issues like in the West, issues surrounding the status of embryos are very complex. Can the surplus fertilized eggs be destroyed? Can surplus fertilized eggs be used in research? The principle of public benefits, a kind of ethical utilitarianism, exists in Sharia law. So the religious authorities ask themselves, do the possible public benefits of stem cell research outweigh the insult to the dignity of the surplus fertilized eggs? The destruction of surplus fertilized eggs is permitted under Sharia law because it is an unavoidable consequence of the process of in vitro fertilization in which more than one egg is fertilized. The destruction of the surplus fertilized eggs is termed unavoidable abortion. It is a, a necessary but secondary consequence. There is no possibility that a surplus fertilized egg can be donated and implanted in another woman. This is forbidden in Sharia law. There is no option for surrogacy or for a couple to adopt a surplus fertilized egg. Adoptions which are available in the West. Okay. The issue of whether surplus fertilized eggs can be used in embryonic research has only recently arisen in Islamic bioethics because they simply didn't do this in the Islamic world. Existing fatwas do, however, make a distinction between a surplus fertilized egg and a fertilized egg attached to a uterine wall. The latter possesses dignity, but the unattached egg possesses at most partial dignity. So all of the rights of a fetus do not obtain pre-fetus stage, pre insolment Neither egg possesses sanctity. Okay. Preference is in the thoughts was given to a third option, and that is to let the surplus eggs thaw and be allowed to die in a natural way. Chicken, but this option does not involve direct aggression against the, the life of the egg. Okay. How are we doing for time? Okay. In terms of assisted reproductive technologies, Sunni and Shiite Islam are quite different. I did not know this. So, we have two quotations in the Quran. Surah 42. Unto God belongs the sovereignty of the heavens and the earth. God creates what God wills. God bestows female offspring on whom God wills, and male offspring on whom God wills. God mingles male and female offspring and makes barren whom God wills. That seems to about cover everything. Okay. Now, however, Surah 21. This is the birth of John the Baptist. This is the story of John the Baptist in the Quran. We find this in Luke's Gospel, right? Zechariah cried unto God, my God, leave me not childless. I thought you were the best of all inheritors. Then we heard his prayer and bestowed upon him John and transformed his wife to bear a child for him. And she was chaste, therefore we breathed into her of our spirit and made her and her son a sign for all peoples. Just as an aside, there's a great deal of information about Christianity in the Quran. It is accurate and it is sympathetic. Muhammad knew a great deal about Christianity from his travels on the Silk Road. He must have met other Christian monks and uh, other Christian import-export traders. I think these two quotations sum up the positions in Islam for the use of assisted reproductive technologies. Both of them a specific Quranic verse. Position one, 
absolutely rejects all forms of assisted reproductive technology. Position two, the John Baptist. It allows for some use of some assisted reproductive technologies. No religious authority unconditionally allows assisted reproductive technologies. So with regard to the limited acceptance of assisted reproductive technologies, Collective Ijtihad asks, is Act X using assisted reproductive technologies in conformity with God's will? God wills that a person achieve both good in this world and in the next. Will this act X using this permitted assisted reproductive technology, will this act cause more benefit than harm? This is again the, the position, the principle of, of ethical utilitarianism at work in Sharia law. Fatwas are very rarely abstract principles. They are based on specific cases in people's lived realities. And these realities are just sometimes too complex to be divided into absolute moral categories of good and bad or permitted or forbidden, okay? Assisted reproductive technologies exist in that huge gray area between permitted and forbidden. Best is if you don't use it, but your wives are a place of sowing seed for you. So come to your place of cultivation however you wish. Okay, but fear God and know that you will meet God at some point. Okay. So the morally responsible use of assisted reproductive technology prohibits the use of any third party. Okay. No third party can contribute any reproductive material that contains genetic characteristics. Don't even think CRISPR. Not in the Muslim world. Not now. There is no surrogacy under any circumstances. Except. <laughs> this surprised me greatly in class. Shiite religious authorities in Iran have adopted a much more permissive view, something I would not normally expect from the very austere Ayatollahs. Shiite Islam allows embryo and sperm donation as part of infertility treatments. Iran, in 2005, became the only Muslim country to legally permit this assisted reproductive technology. And I have been trying for months to get my hands on a transcript of that debate, because I want to know the legal reasoning, okay? In, uh, in about the 1980s, at the same time, bioethics had to address questions and problems related to when a human life begins. Advances in successful organ donation and transplantation require Islamic bioethics to confront the question of when does a human life end? That's not so simple anymore, okay? What constitutes human death? Is brain death a legitimate determinant of human death? now that other organs can continue to function using artificial means. I think in some ways we are back at the beginning when human life was determined by insolment. Human death, according to the fatwas, occurs when the soul separates from the body. So how is this determined? I love this one. They will ask you concerning the spirit or the soul. Say, the spirit or the soul is by command of God and of knowledge. We have been given but little. I even hear a Western doctor tell you that. Right? They're just going to, oh, well, yeah. this works, this works, this doesn't, this doesn't, add them all up. Okay, dead. All right? 
uh, there's a much more nuanced definition of what it means to be human. We have to take the metaphysical into account. Okay? One conventional definition of human death is when irreversible, irreversible loss of respiration has occurred, but with CPRs and ventilators, that's, that's no longer so helpful. Nor is there a widely agreed upon definition of brain death yet among either religious specialists or medical specialists. Especially now that essentially brain dead people can be kept physically or at least minimally alive on life support. Religious authorities are, I think, rightly skeptical of this argument of neurological reductionism that equates brain death with full human death. And both sides in this discussion are trying to avoid entanglements from a slippery slope argument, but just how does one determine with absolute certainty when a coma or brain death is irreversible? Physicians cannot as yet give us an informed opinion of when precisely the soul leaves the body. So one of the conclusions of the conference on the topic of brain death as definitive death is the idea that the soul is not entirely a metaphysical concept. Quite interesting. There are physical indicators of consciousness that denote the presence of the soul in the body. The soul controls volitional actions of the body and some sensory perceptions. And when these functions cease irreversibly, this constitutes evidence for the religious authorities that the soul has left the body. And until quite recently, this was the agreed upon marker of human death. But Saudi Arabia and Qatar, hence this class, passed legislation establishing brain death as the legal definition of death over the objections of the religious scholars in this case. Said you cannot reduce a person to just the physical must take cognizance of the metaphysical components of a person as well. Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. Um, yeah. The answer to when a, a person is legally dead is necessary to answer questions concerning organ donation and transplants. Okay. Earlier arguments uh, were against this. Organ donation and transplantation is mutilation because the body possesses sanctity. God is the owner of one's body. And the success rate of organ transplantation was low. But beginning in the late 70s, 80s, the Grand Mufti of Egypt shifted fatwas in the direction allowing blood transfusions, skin grafts, corneal transplants, and finally organ transplants, as long as the dignity of both the donor and recipient are respected. So now organ transplantation is judged to be no more than any other kind of required surgery. Why should we do this? This is a beautiful saying from Surah 5. Whoever kills a man, a human being, it shall be as if he had killed all mankind. Whoever saves the life of one human being, it shall be as if he saved the life of all mankind. We also find this in the Talmud, but you need to save that person. Because that, that one person possesses sanctity, okay? And it is now acceptable for a Muslim to receive an, an organ donated from a non-Muslim. And this was a big, this was a big deal. Um, and the fatwa said, no, it, it, religion makes much more, one's, one's personal religion makes much more sense in the afterlife than here. Okay, as long as it is a good person who has lived purity of life, that organ is fine. Okay? Fatwas dealing with end-of-life issues make a clear distinction. Again, I think this is helpful. Between saving a life 
and keeping a terminally ill patient mentally alive through medical intervention. Fatwas take cognizance of quality of life. Human life, I get that, all human life possesses sanctity, but it also possesses markers of quality. If medical intervention will not restore a patient to an acceptable quality of life, the medical intervention should not be applied or should maybe withdrawn if it's already been applied. What matters is the closeness to God one has towards the end of one's life. And this idea is part of the public policy of pain management. If you had to medicate someone into imbecility, they're no longer conscious of their relationship to God. How is that helpful, right? So pain management to a degree, but that kind of pain management may make us unconscious about the world. Uh, active euthanasia is forbidden, I'm always saying, right? Um, pain management that as a secondary effect may shorten the person's life, that is allowable. Right? But active euthanasia at this point is not. So the end of life issues in the Quran, and here is the Hadith. And this is Muhammad speaking. None of you should make a wish to die because of damage or disease or illness that was struck. If it is unavoidable, then you should pray to God, O oh God, whenever life is better for me, then let me live. And whenever death is better for me, then let me die. Ultimately, the outcome resides, I think, in God's hands. Thank you for the privilege of your time. Thank you. So do we want to do a Q&A here, or what do you want to do? Well, since, since you noted my head, why don't you uh, offer that? All right. Okay. <laughs> Hello. Do you think it's a good thing that religious authorities, do you think it's a good thing that religious authorities should be involved in science, medical, yeah, yanni, yanni. <laughs> That's the answer to all of the questions. Yanni, yanni. <laughs> mish, mish. Okay? Is it a good thing that public policies in, uh, take account of uh, the thinking, the ethical thinking of religious scholars as well as the medical scientists? Is that a good or a bad thing? It's a good thing. What do you think? I think in a pluralistic society, if you have a group representing a broad base of religions, so you can kind of hone in on what's ethically good. Okay, that's question number two. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. But in a pluralistic society, we really have to be... And we, you know, okay, my question was, mm -hmm. fine, this is majority Muslim yes. society, so they're listening to one strain of, mm -hmm. of religious scholar. Can you imagine? in a religiously pluralistic society like the United States, whose religious voice is going to be heard in these? Do you think it would work? Gary, what do you think? Well, in fact, that's what the Supreme Court recently did with, uh, with abortion. They said, uh, you all figure it out in a representative government, and the states will decide based on the opinions of the people. OK, well. So, there so you, you can there abrogate you your responsibilities, to, fine. But they did it on privacy. There, 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 you have a, there you have a representation. There was no of, religion in that thing either. It was based on the argument of privacy, which was a weak argument. Even Ginsburg said it. it's the best we can do, but it's a weak argument. And I don't, I don't know how we would do this in a, a religiously fractured or fragmented society like the United States. There. There are um, friends of the court briefs, or there are people who write, you know, the National Conference of Catholic Bishops has policy papers, and the Southern Baptists have policy papers. I, I don't, I, I see problems. I mean, I want there to be ethics. Now, we have ethics to the extent that we have protection of human research participants, but I don't think we have a meta-ethical framework for any of this, I think. And we're just unleashing 
technology without much consequences to the, the social impact of it. Certainly Roe v. Wade has had a lot of negative social impact. Whether you agree with the decision or not, the consequences have been negative for, for many. Well, we, we live in a country with the represent, representative governments that so are positioned by uh, federal governments and states, and that's how we make decisions. The, the Supreme Court adjudicates whether those, are, those decisions are legal or not and sends it back to the legislature. Yeah, I understand how it works. These are the same nine people who, they're the only people in the country who don't know what pornography is. <laughs> I mean, so, you know, we know it when you see it. Like, like there's the guy at the dirty bookstore, and you're like, I don't know what to order. I don't know what my clients want. Yeah. All right, what do you got? So, the Supreme Court kicked it back to the states. Uh, let's talk like about Islamic bioethics. However, the states could kick it back to the individual religious believers. Well, they, Muslims, they take, uh, yeah, Muslims. there's been voter referendums. Uh, and, but I mean, they could say, uh, abide by the precepts of the religion you claim to believe in. I mean, that, that's the ultimate. Uh, that's well, the yeah, ultimate, that may uh, be what we make that our, our decisions as individuals. Right? Yes, exactly. That would not about what it amounts to. But not exactly as individuals, because they could say, well, you know, except the, uh, for, for the sake of order, you remember the community, except the decision of your community. Okay. Should governments be able? What do you got? I'm sorry, well, I don't know. Yeah. took this. Um, what if you lived in a majority Muslim country and you didn't agree with a medical fatwa? What would be your options? Am I Muslim? You move away. If, if I'm Muslim, I can fatwa shop. Right. Okay. Yeah. If, yeah. I'm, yeah. if I'm non Muslim, it doesn't apply to me. Let her repeat the question so others can hear. Okay, okay, she wanted to know so if it has I'm in a Muslim majority country and I don't agree with the fatwa, what do I do? My options are to seek another fatwa, to move to another jurisdiction in order to seek another fatwa. You can fatwa shop. If I am non-Muslim, it's not clear that it applies to me at all. Okay, that's part of my question is... Um, but if it's not available does the in the country... fatwa have impact on the law of the land? Most definitely. Yeah. Fatwas are, are instrumental in designing public policy that then results in legislation. Right? But it's not clear, and it would depend on the Muslim country. It's not clear. If it's simply not available because of the reigning fatwa in that country, then I would have to leave that country. If I am a non-Muslim, it's but it's still not available in the country. I would have to leave in order to seek availability. But they've got some very interesting decisions in, in the, the, the Islamic Academy for Muslims in North America who have a greater range of options, in medical options in this country. Well, you still until three months ago. If I, if I was a Muslim woman and I needed to get some advice that I live here in the States, who would I contact? The Islamic Organization for Muslims in North America. Or you could simply ask your own doctor. I mean, are you a pious Muslim? Absolutely. Okay, then <laughs> you go to the, the Muslim Organization for Muslims in North, North America. What happened three months ago? Yeah. Roe v. Wade. Was that three months ago? Whenever it was. <laughs> My outside flies. Okay. Any other questions or you know one? Um, so back to um, the idea of donor eggs. What's the reasoning behind prohibiting that? And if uh, a family adopts a child that's got completely different genetic, you know, I mean, but they is that child not really considered their own? No, no, adoption is is fine. Okay, you, but that's outside each of, in, yeah. individual. Each individual is a unique genetic specimen, never to be repeated. Right? So, can't mess with that by changing it. That's why some of the CRISPR techniques and 
genetic medicine are going to be very problematic when they become possibly available in the Muslim world, what are the fatwas going to look like? Because the argument is based on genetic uniqueness. Okay? Right now, assistive reproductive technologies do not allow a, genet a, a, genet a uniquely genetic egg from an outside source to be input into a woman. But Islam is, is very, very compassionate in terms of um, a child, an infant, is not responsible for the circumstances of its birth. So whatever is decided, it, the infant cannot bear the brunt of the penalty. Okay? So if uh, it's paternity belongs to the father. In the marriage, I don't. I, the woman would have to have committed fornication in the town square on market day <laughs> in order for that child to be considered illegitimate. Okay, because the penalties for the woman and on the child are extremely harsh. So unless there is just overwhelming evidence, Sharia law protects the child and the woman. And by extension, probably, that we use that argument by analogy to extend the protections to fertilized eggs or adoptions. You can't adopt an egg. You can adopt a child once it's here, mm -hmm. okay. but you can't adopt an egg. Because how would you grow it? Don't ask that question yet. <laughs> no, you know, no, science will no, no cloning. Don't even start. No. No. Okay, let's take uh, one more question. We got one in the front, sir. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. So, suppose, um, was there a fatwa? Was there a fatwa concerning tubal, tubal pregnancy? Pregnancy, not in the uterus, but in the tubes? Of course. Okay. Okay. It, it, Medically necessary abortion to protect the life of the mother, the life and the health of the mother. She would suffer serious medical complications, even death. So that's a medically necessary, unavoidable abortion. There's no abortion as a means of birth control. That's, I, I haven't read a single fatwa, nothing even approaching that. There has to be an overwhelming reason why the woman wouldn't carry the pregnancy to term. Just to protect the mother. Yes, yeah, to protect the mother. She still has rights. Because she, she has sanctity, because she's here. Right. I'm assuming, but I may not be correct, that they do not believe in contraception or birth control. Yes? No? <laughs> okay, now we're entering sociology. Okay, we are dealing with rather rigid gender-specific stereotypic roles in traditional societies. Contraception is available. Okay, everything I said applies only to heterosexual married couples. You must be in a legally contracted Quranic marriage. No single women who've looked around and you know can't find anybody and the biological clock is ticking, that's too bad. No single women, no gays, uh, no, I'm not sure about mixed, mar mixed faith marriages because that's not a Quranically valid marriage. So I don't know where they fall. I don't have one, so I didn't have to research that. But I don't know where they would fall. In that. But contraception is available. Can the woman... Uh, obtain the contraception, or does the what brother country? or a husband? Well, I know. I mean, yeah, what country? I mean, Saudi Arabia. I have no idea. Qatar? Yes. That's Riyadh? No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, probably not. You know, it, it depends. These are very traditional Muslim societies. They they do share a, a, a sociology in that respect. Women have some rights, and, and then there's just, what happens? What about in Indonesia? 
you know, Indonesia is a, a majority Muslim country, but it's not represented in these institutes. Mm -hmm. This is what I found strange. They, they acknowledge Muslims in Great Britain, Muslims in the United States and candidates for North America. <clears throat> what about Muslims in the rest of the world that are not Middle East, but still in overwhelming numbers, Islamic? And I don't know what they do. I don't. It's very rare to find a Shiite voice at these conferences, somebody from Iran. Are, are the largest number of Muslims in any country in Indonesia? Percentage of population yeah. is majority Muslim, but they're not Middle Eastern, and I don't find non-Middle Eastern voices represented in these institutes, which was one thing I was really looking for, because I thought about Indonesia as well. Anything else? Okay, you got another one? Well, just hang on. Whoa, you're That's okay. Um, she can belt it out. She's yeah. a preacher. Come yeah, on. Yeah, okay. So I guess, for, I guess one of the takeaways is that there is more latitude in Islam than there is in Texas. Legally. <laughs> Are we still recording this? Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> that is correct. Okay. So, yeah. It and depends. Now, come on. We've there. got a sociology here, too. Fatwas, these are you know, the ideals, and then who knows what goes on between a woman and a doctor in the doctor's office? Who knows what was said? Who knows what was said? I don't know. And how do you monitor that? But several times you talk about fatwa. That means any individual fatwa is, is not necessarily wide-ranging. They are authoritative. They are the majority opinion, so they are wide-ranging, but they are not exclusive and they are not binding. They are not the Okay. At this point. And sometimes with the majority opinion because the technology is simply not available in the Muslim world. Open heart transplants if we don't have one in a medical center in Indonesia. That's not a problem that's going to come up in our jurisdiction. So these are kind of facts on the ground driven. If that makes any sense. They don't go looking for laws are, are written in response to a big enough problem that we need to have a decision because people are asking us and we need to know what to tell them. Which is, I think, a pretty good way to derive legislation. What's up? And if you're a doctor in that country, are you fatwa shopping? what you're going to practice or what you're going to tell your patient or are you made to follow a certain there's line? there's there's laws right uh, everybody oh, here since she's like you know can assume so but if i'm at you know king saud medical center in saudi arabia and i decide to do this procedure I could lose my hospital privileges, you know. So there are ways to control. But it, I, I wanted people to know fatwas are not these ugly, nasty, zero tolerance things that we learn about. Yeah, the one, the Salman Rushdie, that was unfortunate. Okay, but he got those <coughs> verses from a 1905 book by Theodore Nestor, who asked when he said it in print. So he wasn't the first one. So if you'd read your bibliography, you'd know. But he's the one. And, and because the Ayatollah has died, there's no one who can extend that fatwa. Not one based. That was. There, I've been talking about fatwas based on medicine, science, bioethics. There are fatwas based on faith and morals. And those have a much more permanent quality to them. So he's never going to get out from under that. Hmm. Yeah. Um, if, if, you if a doctor if, uh, is practicing, a Muslim doctor is practicing in this country, does that doctor have different responsibilities in terms of, of paying attention to fatwas if they're dealing with a non Muslim patient versus a Muslim patient? I mean, do they have a, an option for other treatments that might not be permissible with a Muslim patient if they could be with a Christian? I want to believe that doctors will respond in the way that is best for their patient. Yeah. I mean, I'm 
difficult situations. I, I had, it wasn't really a thought for, but I had a Muslim student uh, in, in one of my classes, and when she graduated, she was going to have to return which she did not want. And she begged me to fail her so that she could stay for another, at least another semester. Something like a miracle would happen. You know, her intended husband would drop dead, or she was, you know, something that, you know, here's this 20, 21 year old woman and girl, and she thought, this is, you know, the only time I'm going to be independent in my life. And it's hard to know what the right thing to do is in those situations. Did you fail her? <laughs> no comment. <laughs> no, I, I did not, but I found her a one year scholarship so that she could stay, so that I could tell the parents this is an unbelievable opportunity, yada, yada, yada. Please let her stay. I, mean, I bought her a year. I, I didn't know what else to do. Well. The best I could do. Sometimes that's what fatwas are, they're the best we can do right now in this untenable situation. Because if the situation wasn't problematic, I wouldn't need a fatwa, right? Okay. But you do understand, you got some idea of there should be some religious or ethical component to these decisions, and it shouldn't simply be based on science and profit. Okay, then I've done my job. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think there are more cookies in the lab. I was going to say there